give a warm welcome to th this amazing group of artisans. Uh, Jack, uh, uh, Renee Haynes, indigenous casting director. <laughs> Ellen Lewis, casting director. Sean Grigg, makeup artist to Mr. DiCaprio. Kay Georges, hair department. Thomas Nellen, makeup department head. Mark Uleno, production sound mixer. Jack Fisk, production design. Julie O'Keefe, Osage clothing consultant. And Jacqueline West, costume designer. Welcome, welcome. I've never had such a huge turnout for a panel. Amazing. I'll start with you, um, Jacqueline. Um, and if you could give us a, a perspective of the importance of the story to be told, and also as an artisan, the, the importance of being accurate um, to the story. Well, for me, it was the most important part of my job because I, when I read the book, I was absolutely appalled that this is a story that we never learn about in school, that for obvious reasons. And I felt this would be so, such a profound story to tell for the people, this beautiful nation of the Osage, that it would, it was such a seminal time in their history. And I knew even before having met them that I had to get it right, that I owed that to them. It couldn't be just a cookie cutter Native American Hollywood movie. And then I met with Marty and I felt that was the most important thing to him, that it was authentic and that uh, there couldn't be any slip ups. It really did have to, be perfect. So I started doing research, and I researched it up at my house in Deadwood, South Dakota, for four months. And I arrived in uh, Oklahoma with about 2,000 pieces of research. Wow. And my fabulous crew, who did all the background, they would take a face and dress the person just, they would find a face on those boards and dress the person exactly like that. But we were looking at everything in black and white, and I realized in color it was going to have to be authentic. And so we would photograph uh, colors in black and white to see exactly how they were going to translate into all those photos. And then you can look at a, a thousand photos and still not understand the nuance of how things should be worn or when they should be worn, because usually photographs are posed or their studio photographs or their home movies, which only the Osage could afford at $1,800 a minute. But then you had to learn the, the subtlety uh, of when you wear a blanket, how you wear a blanket, and when you wear a shawl. Uh, just there was such nuance mm -hmm. to the whole thing. And so uh, this angel landed in my my department, Julie O'Keefe, who was sent to us by Chief Standing Bear. And with her, she brought knowledge of all the best Osage artisans. And what that meant is that she was we were going to be able to involve the Osage in the telling of this story, which was so important to them. And she brought the best people and the best knowledge. Take it away. So when I came on to the movie, and I have never been in this industry before, and so um, you know, walking in the first day to Jacqueline's studio, I see exactly how she has organized uh, traditional men, traditional women, and uh, modern clothing on Osages of the 1920s, and then modern clothing with a blanket. And so you know, as you're looking up on the screen, and you see the snapshot of this family, you're looking at a human struggle with this family of these women. 
And so what's really happened in within that scene that it is undercurrent is that you have Lizzie Q, who was raised on the prairie. She hunted buffalo. She and her husband both did. And they lived off the land. The value is never, was never in the money for us because we didn't live that way. We were surviving. So they have their children. And in that time period is when the government came in and the choice was, we will cut your rations or you will send your children to missionary school or military school if you're a boy. So she sends her girls away. And when they come back, they come into back home and they're speaking English. So they are first English speakers in their own lands, similar to immigrants today, but we're immigrants in our own land. Now you're sitting with a group of women who are acclimating to this life that they're being forced into. And on top of it, a great deal of wealth drops on them, every single member of the tribe. So now everyone is sitting there trying to understand where do I fit and how do I stay safe in this new world trying to acclimate into this. And so you see the examples of each one. You see Anna, who is committing to modern clothing. You see Molly, who basically is choosing to stay traditional in her Osage clothes, but possibly with a beautiful pair of French shoes or a, a beautiful handbag. Then you see the other two women, and they're in modern clothing, but they're still showing who they are on the inside by the blankets they're wearing. And these blankets and shawls are worn for the particular life event that's happening to you on the day. If you're going to go see your guardian, Molly has on this blanket, and it's really a power suit. She's going in, and what she's presenting to her guardian, who's making decisions about everything in her life, and she's basically saying, I've come to do business with you. The other thing that she's really saying that he doesn't understand, and you're going to do business with me, and we wear those blankets for certain things all the way to the White House today. The silhouette that you saw with the traditional clothing has not changed for over 150 years. The technology of the fabric has changed, but the silhouette itself does not. And you saw that in the very last scene where we're all dancing around that drum and we've made it through all the horror, everything that has gone through that time period, generations down now. And we have held on to our culture and we've kept hold of that. And that's the example of what you saw tonight. And that's what I saw in Jacqueline's studio the first day I walked in and I understood that she understood authenticity and she saw us. I also understood that Martin Scorsese, rolling from the top down, has what wanted an authentic story and he had surrounded himself with every person on this stage for a commitment of authenticity and they've all done it with integrity. And integrity, there, if, you have, if you don't have integrity, you have nothing. And so that is how they chose to tell this native story. And we never get the representation in any of the nations. But the days of Gunsmoke and Bonanza, they're gone. And this is the way forward for telling native stories. And this movie has set a bar now that I hope everyone pays attention to. That's great. great. Julie. Um, would you care to explain the the wedding sequence is stunning and I, I would love to hear you is, explain why she wears the regalia that she wears uh, at her wedding. So that is a traditional Osage wedding coat and during the time of, of Thomas Jefferson there was a delegation of Osages that went to Washington, D.C., and at this time, we're a new country. The United States is a new country. So they're really trying to show their power and their might. So they're bringing these different delegations from different nations in. So we go up, and when we're getting ready to leave, one of the, the leaders admires this coat that a military uh, gentleman has next to Jefferson. And so Jefferson turns around and says, take your coat off, and gives it to him like we would give diplomatic gifts. And he gives it as a gift to this chief. So 
in history, and it's written within France and in and, and different countries when they saw Osages, we, we are very, we have some very statuesque and tall men strapping, and they couldn't fit into European style of clothing. So what they ended up doing was they would give these blankets back to their daughters. And so uh, these delegations would go back and forth and you would see these different Osage, or these military coats in this family. So what they did is the, the family would get together and the daughters started using those as their Osage wedding coats. But these coats weren't just as a bride would walk down an aisle in a dress and then you put it away. Everything that she has on is going to be given away. And it's given away to someone who has helped you with this wedding, who's been instrumental in putting all of this together. And typically it was six to eight wedding coats that you would see in one of these uh, uh, Osage weddings. And if you were marrying a woman who had that Osage coat on, you knew that you were marrying someone of great prominence in the tribe. And so they would put ribbon, they would decorate it with their own buttons. I've seen some with pins on the front. They put uh, the silver pins that you saw, the Wabanka pins on the back. They incorporate the French ribbon. All of these materials that you see, the broadcloth, the wool skirts, the way that the shirts are made, all of the, the materials of this and the textiles have integrated themselves since the 1700s all the way down into our clothing. So everything that you see is historic and all of that would be being given away. Amazing, um, and we do need to move on to the rest, but last question, Jacqueline, is about, I was struck seeing your costume design, there is such sense of elegance in all of the women. You know, can you talk about that aspect, the, the elegance? That's the first thing that I was aware of when I started researching the Osage, because I have, in other films, depicted other plains uh, tribes and studied their history and, their, uh, their clothing through different periods. But I noticed, the first thing I noticed about the Osage were, in this period, how elegant they were. And it, it didn't even seem like it was uh, because of their riches. It was a style. I mean, Molly is wearing uh, the clothes, traditional clothes of the Osage, but it's so elegant. I was a fashion designer before I became a costume designer. And I'm very, my mother was a fashion designer and for couture. And I'm very aware of line and style. And I thought it was one of the most beautiful silhouettes I'd ever seen. The combination of the blanket, the skirt, the leggings, the moccasins, all of it, I thought was just absolutely beautiful and elegant. And I found that in other, other areas of the Osage their ribbon work, their finger weaving, uh, their, the way they would take old uh, piece metals, uh, coins, and, and hammer them into Wabanka pins, and they're like lace, that silver. Just beautiful. Very elegant. Very elegant style these people had, have. Oh, thank you. Um, next is Jack Fisk, production design. Jack, um, there is so much Western iconography that we're familiar in your designs and in the film, but it comes across as a West that is in transition. Um, can you talk about uh, your production design in the film? Uh, <clears throat> the West was changing fast. Uh, the Osage people were assimilating into a new world and uh, and every everybody was adjusting. I uh, I just want to say one thing about the film is you get one chance to make it right, and so we all work very hard to take advantage of that because I don't know when another film of this scale will get made, and um, if we were to let down, that forever would be what people uh, reflected on. So. Uh, I know I tried my hardest to, to get things right, but I realize there's so much to learn, you know, about a culture. And in the year we have, uh, you know, you, you, you may fall short, but the heart was in there. And we got so much cooperation from the uh, Osage people and the white people in Osage County. Um, 
everybody, I think, felt that it needed to be told. The story needed to be told. They'd been living with it for so long. And, uh, and I worked to find out how the Osage lived, you know, how they, they were living. Because I, when I got there, I didn't see mansions. And I didn't see, uh, I had a misconception that they were the wealthiest people in America and they would be living in mansions and, and uh, living sort of ostentatiously. But they weren't. They, um, they had a great sense of style. They collected china and ribbon and beads and blankets. And they liked objects. They loved cars the way they used to love horses. And they would paint them colors they liked. So they, they weren't bound by Henry Ford in his black car. Uh, in Fairfax at the time, there was uh, two shops that painted cars. And, uh, and I like that about them. They had an artistic approach to life. And they seemed very happy. And I don't think they ever referred, or I'd read that they didn't refer to themselves as wealthy. But they enjoyed all the finer things that they could afford. Um, I was struck with, with uh, Molly's house. And you addressed it a little bit, how humble it was. And it, but to me, it's like a linchpin to the film, your design of Molly's house. Can you talk about that? For me, Molly's house was the key to the design of the film. And that's where I started. And it took a while to find out where her house was. Uh, David Grand wrote a wonderful book, but he was concentrating a lot on the FBI. And uh, he didn't really pinpoint where Molly's house was. But in reading the court records of her mother's uh, probate, I found that she lived with her mother. She didn't have a house of her own until 1923, I think. They had, she had a house that the Indian agency had helped her put on her allotted land so she could rent it. But she had always, she said in this uh, probate, I don't have a house. I live with my mother, and it's the house that I grew up in. And uh, so that gave me a clue. And then she lived in Gray Horse, and uh, then I needed to find the house. And uh, Maggie uh, Burkhart is a granddaughter of Molly. And she talked about living in Gray Horse as a kid. So I sort of said, well, that might be the house that they, uh, her father inherited from his uh, grandmother. And I talked to John Williams, and I talked to some people in the, uh, a lot of people in, in Gray Horse. And they remember the Burkhart children getting on the school bus and going to school with them. So I may be wrong, I may not be. But I think that that was a very modest house that they grew up in. I later found out that they had bought a farm in 1923, the Brush Farm. And I think at the time it was about 160 acres. By the time Molly died, she had about 400 acres of, of farmland there. And they, she didn't like living on the farm because she was having problems with uh, her health and wanted to be down in, in the town of Fairfax. She moved to Six in Elm Street. And we know that she was there because I saw the deed for the land. And it was property that her mother, Lizzie Q, had owned and sold. And she somehow got it back. And they put it in the names of their two children. But uh, in the reports from the Indian agency, there were uh, her requests to buy certain furniture for that house and also to put a sleeping porch on that house. And I went into the house that happened to be for sale, and I saw the, the way they'd enclosed a, uh, an outside porch to make a sleeping porch. And in the back of the house, there was um, a wall that looked a lot like um, the wall behind a picture of Ernest and his two children. It, was a, it was happened to be a picture that James, his son, had torn Ernest's head off because he was angry with his father. But it was an important clue. Anyway, once I found out they didn't live in mansions, I could kind of relax. And I looked around Fairfax, and most of the houses were small craftsman homes. And even though the Osage were making, you know, the equivalents of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, when the average American family was probably getting three thousand, uh, they didn't. They didn't flaunt it. They didn't. They they just they had such taste in the stuff they liked, and that's what we tried to show in Molly's house. You know, with the spode china and the, you know, the, the the attention to the furniture and how well it was kept, that they treasured them the same way. I think in the past they probably treasured horses, or 
you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the the other piece of your design that that blew me away was the pool hall and that it reeks of conspiracy with those big windows that look out to the street. Can you talk about how did you arrive at that set? Yeah, the pool hall was probably the opposite of the Osage, and that's where uh, Hale and his crew would you know, love to frequent. Uh, when I was a kid, I grew up in Illinois, I used to get my hair cut at the uh, pool hall. Uh, my mother would take me in there when I was about three years old, and they put a board on across the arms of the of the barber chair and I'd sit there and, and I was always aware of these clicking balls and the people in the background. So when I started reading the script and they were separate sets, I mentioned to Marty, uh, you could combine those. And I found on the Fairfax maps, the old Fairfax maps, that there were several pool halls that also had barber shops in them. And uh, so Marty wanted to be so authentic that anytime uh, I presented an idea to him, I'd present backup. And I was able to show him the maps, uh, you know, 1915, and there's, you know, here's a pool hall, and it's got a, a barber shop, and, and he really responded to all that. And I think he got to trust me that, you know, my ideas weren't just being pulled out of the air, but were based on things. But the great thing about that pool hall, it was a appliance store when we found it, and it had a drop ceiling, and they'd closed off the uh, clear story windows, and they put a hard awning on it. And we went in and were able to gut the building and get back to the walls and go up to 14 foot ceilings and open the, the glass that's above the picture windows. And it became a great place for the, um, you know, Ernest and his guys because they could keep an eye on the whole world out there. They were like watching it. And for us, there was so much production value because of the depth. I mean, you weren't just seeing the pool hall, but you were seeing the street, and you were seeing the other side of the street, you were seeing the dance hall, you were seeing the cars go by. They could keep an eye on who was doing what, you know, and, and that it became a very effective setting for that. Well, thank you, Jack. Um, Mark Uleno, production sound mixer. I, I, I have to ask you about my favorite scene, which is uh, Leo and, and Lily at their house having a quiet moment and the storm hits. The sound design in that sequence is just phenomenal. Can you talk about uh, mixing? And I, I can. I, I, I want to continue this theme of, of, of uh, uh, intent and, and, cult and culture dignity. Um, and that's a good scene to, to think about in that regard. The thing that is important to me is in, in, in concert with these these other artists is the idea of, of, ex of revealing character through our particular instrument. And so um, that has to do with tonality and character revelation through tonality. And in that scene, the, the intimacy of that scene is this counterpoint of the, you know, earnest struggling ambivalence between love and, and, and betrayal and Molly's underlying profound dignity through the culture of, of the Osage. And a lot of that is transmitted through their voices, whether they're in extremity or even in intimacy. And so that's a good scene for counterpoint for the scenes that have higher, higher dynamics in terms of the business of those scenes. Here we're in that, that quietness. And it still continues this. Molly is sort of the anchor in their relationship as I see it. And that there's this, um, and it's in the language itself in a way. Um, and language actually becomes a very important piece for the uh, energy of the characters and their position in the, in the story arc. Um, we have Leo who has, you know, I think he disappears into the part in a way that it's, we're, we're, we're seeing a performance of the character, not and of his, Leo. And his voice, he yes. changed it and designed it. How difficult was it to capture It's very those? specific, that's right. He, he found um, a representation of his character, not just in his physicality, but in his tonality. And I mean, I, there were days I would close my eyes and I could hear that, that anxiety, ambivalence in his character, just in, in, in terms of, of you know, the way he captured that character. And then Molly, um, through her, I mean, she's always this sort of even keel, you know, sort of Ma Jode and uh, and Grapes of Wrath kind of even keel kind of uh, anchoring presence in her her all of her even in the in the worst moments 
she carries that forward. And then, then the William, William Hale character who uses language by his achieving fluency as a, as a tool of, of deception because it, inv it, it invites, when you go into another culture and you want to become welcomed and accepted in that culture, the first and most significant step is language. Mm -hmm. And so each of these three characters are using language in, in an interesting triangle, um, one as you know, as I say, it's the Osage, the dignity of the Osage, the, 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 the ambivalence of, of the returning veteran, you know, who's a moral and finding actually love in his life, and then of this master conspirator, you know, who's using language to, to create the perception of, of, of loyalty and support when in fact he's, he's creating the most, you know, um, uh, violent um, conspiracy uh, over, over greed. So I have to ask you, you know, the late Robbie Robertson did the score for the film, which is a stunning score. Uh, you know, working with him, mixing, um, I, I, I was blown away. I've seen the film a couple of times. The this strings, Percussive, the, yes. the percu percussion is like a stunning score. Tell us about I, mixing. I, I'm going to tell you how I, re I read the the design of that. And I think it's in a direct reflection of the, actually the, the, the design of the plot line. It's unusual, the plot line. It's, you know, we're mostly um, engaged in, th in a three act form in, in, telling, in telling movies and uh, telling the story with films. And this has that underlying, but there's there, there, it's, it's laying on the foundation of, of a continuing crescendo type of design in the story plot. And I think Robbie is plugged very much into that with his score. It's like a bolero, essentially. And you, you are forever in this you know, rising moment to get to, the, you know, get to the, uh, the, the, the key transition point where she actually becomes, you know, has to confront herself and realize you know, the difference between her, her, her love and you know, the betrayal that, that makes that impossible. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, next, Thomas uh, Nellen, makeup department head. I want to ask you about uh, the progression of Nellie's, um, uh, I, I mean, Molly's illness, and, and you deline delineate her progression with the makeup. Can you talk about that aspect? Yeah, well, when I first came aboard, I didn't know anything about the Osage Nation. I'm from Switzerland, and uh, that's not what we learned at school. So, um, <clears throat> but I mean, I've been living here for a few years, but uh, still, I got the call when I was in Switzerland, and I did my research of the 1920s, the, the fashion, the, 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 the French fashion, European fashion that influenced the Osage Nation. And then once I got to Oklahoma, I learned more into depth what the what uh, uh, Marion Bauer. She had this incredible research department that, uh, with mock shots and photos of the actual people that were affected by the story. And then, of course, in depth conversation with Marty. And uh, the the number one thing that stood out was because Molly was more the traditional type. You know, we, we had the fashion type that would like use some makeup, French, you know, French style makeup. Uh, even though we had to consider the the humidity in the summer and the mugginess and the, the sweat and everything that the people would like with all the woolen costumes and, uh, but they, you know, they would sweat. So, and then with Molly, we wanted to make sure that she is because she is the traditional type that she um, has to look natural. Authentic, authentic was a big word uh, that came up in every conversation. Uh, we wanted to make sure because it's such a, 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 a sensitive subject matter <clears throat> that we really portray these people to the best of our knowledge to uh, re represent them in the, their best way. So we uh, started by doing makeup tests, of course, conversations also with uh, Lily, Molly, uh, you know, how she saw her part and then how I saw it and then I broke it down in uh, uh, different stages where her health declines from healthy, glowing, fresh looking to the, her near death look. So, uh, and we tested that uh, in, in during pre-production 
And so it was for, first it was like fresh and healthy, and then it was like a little paler, and then it started with circles on the horizon, and then deeper circles, paler. And then during the shoot, she actually broke away for uh, towards the end of the shoot uh, for like two or three weeks, uh, three weeks uh, to lose some weight. She changed her whole eating habits, and um, so then she would actually lose weight, but then we would still use the same uh, makeups that we had tested in the beginning, and they tried to uh, digitally, in the tests, to alter her, slim down her face a little bit, so we could see how gaunt it would look. And then, of course, in, when we shot that, uh, from what I understand, nothing had been altered digitally, so that was all like our makeup, so, but still, I wanted to make sure that you see skin you see her, you feel with her, and you f can feel her pain. And I wanted to make sure that you never feel like she's wearing any makeup, even though, you know, a no makeup look doesn't mean that she this is not wearing any makeup. I mean, there's a lot of work that went into the whole makeup department to actually make sure, even more so maybe because it was not obvious to make sure that you blend it in and to, uh, to make sure that it, you feel the skin so you can actually identify with the character. Yeah. You know? And also what I wanted to add, sorry. No, that, no, no. Uh, in the beginning that, uh, uh, you know, when we started doing the tests, Lily, as well as many others of the Osage uh, people, or indigenous people who came into the trailer, they said, you know, no matter what you do or no matter what I do, even if I stay out of the sun, in three months from now, I'm going to be like three shades darker. And we, we started doing those tests, I think, in April. And of course, by June, July, I mean, it was so muggy and hot and everybody was like, had a tan, whether they would, even if they stayed out of the sun. So I was really glad for that information because then I would warm up to people because they were as pale as they were paler than I was when we first started the pre-production so I um, for continuity reasons I warmed up all the people like three or four shades to then like three months into the story when we were shooting and as you know you never shoot a movie in uh, uh, in um, what, what do you call it in, conti in, in um, sequence sequence so sometimes you shoot the beginning at the end and the, the end at the beginning and, and, you know. And so we warmed the people up and then three months later when they actually had their own tan, I was able to pull back and change from grease makeup to maybe tanned oils, old for facial oils, to actually just stay on that same level so we never ran into any, any uh, continuity problem because of the weather condition and because of COVID, because that had a big impact too, that that with Lily and everybody had to, they had to put on their mask in between takes. So like, you know, they put them on, they take them off, and which would affect my makeup, of course, because of tan lines all of a sudden, that you had to run in and to touch up the little rubber bands that started to be visible on their faces, or with the wigs that they all of a sudden, the styles changed because of that. and. Uh, yeah, but I'll let Kay now continue with that. Well, you answer <laughs> all of my questions, Thomas. I'm sorry. <laughs> which is amazing. I didn't have to do any follow-up. Um, thank you. Um, Kay uh, Georges, uh, hair department. Um, going back to what Jacqueline was talking about, that each, sis each sister is delineated through costumes. I also noticed that you made sure that each one had its identity through hair. Can you talk about, about that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, Jacqueline, from the beginning, um, when we were talk when we first introduced ourselves on the phone, um, Jackie had this idea that all of the sisters would be very individual, and with, as well with their clothes, with their hair. And Jackie was the one that said there was this fabulous old movie star, Jackie, what was her name? The Natasha Gamborova. Natasha, married to Rudolph Valentino. And she had these wonderful ear phones that she wore, and that was <laughs> on Anna. So Anna was one of the sisters that was 
modern, one of the modern of King Girls. So that was decided, you know, we tested it and that was what we decided for her. Molly was very traditional, so she was going to keep with a traditional hairstyle. And then the other two sisters, they had one of them was slightly more modern and the other one was slightly more traditional. So it was, you know, quite often with what I do, we follow costume. So wherever they go with costume, that's where we go with the hair. You know, it, it dictates to us what we, not dictates, but it leads us. So that was a huge part of deciding how each of the sisters would, you know, come to life in the, on the screen. Um, I have to move on, I apologize. Uh, Sean Grigg, um, makeup artist um, for Leo, um, tell me about the teeth. <laughs> well, when I, we, I've been working with Leo for a long time since Titanic, and the first thing we started with was the photo of Ernest. And for Leo, a big part of his process is forgetting his character is to have visually change himself. And Ernest, um, although we didn't need to make him look exactly like Ernest, we wanted to give him an essence of Ernest. And Leo did not want to look like a film star in the middle of this world. You know, so it was very important that he looked correct for the period and correct for where he was living. Um, and everyone, he had a lot of makeup. He had a prosthetic nose. He had ear augmenters to, che to cheat his ears out. Um, I bleached his eyebrows. And then also he had teeth. But people don't, he looks different and people notice the teeth that actually it's the whole thing that is, wow. that, is yeah. the, that hopefully nobody notices anything else. But the teeth I had made with an augmenter in them as well so that it changed the shape of his mouth and changed the way he spoke a bit. And really the teeth were just... They weren't that different on The Revenant. I made much more substantial teeth on him, but you don't notice them because he doesn't look quite so different. But the teeth were to basically give him a more te period mouth because they didn't have dentists and they didn't have orthodontists back then. So I just wanted his teeth to look less well kept, really, but not, they weren't rotten or anything. They were just slightly more crooked. Thank you very much. And um, Ellen Lewis, cast and director, I have to ask you about all these musicians that are, are part of the cast. You have Jack White, you have Sturgill Simpson, you have Pete Yorn. Um, you know, where, where did that come from to cast? I'm sorry? Charlie Charlie uh, exactly. Where, where did this come from to cast all these great musicians? It wasn't intentional that, uh, that I, I didn't go out, let's have a lot of musicians in the film. But it was trying to, just as you start casting, I mean, we're the first per people on the film actually casting, um, maybe locations, but we're the first people that Marty's office gets in touch with. And I had read the book and knew what this world was and we get amazing photos from Marianne Bauer, who's Marty's archivist and producer. Um, and so you start getting a sense of what the vision that Marty might have for the people. And I reached out to agents who represented uh, country singers because as well as going through, reaching out to agents all over the South Texas, Oklahoma, I'm, Renee will discuss the open call we had, but so it wasn't intentional, it was just about again an authenticity to the period and the time, and I thought that it was possible that country musicians might have that, and so we also were in the middle-ish of the pandemic, so people were not touring and I had agents send me interviews. I didn't need to hear them singing. I needed to hear how they sounded and what they looked like. And from that, I then started to read people. 
I mean, the musicians were just part of many other people that, um, that I was reading for all of these many, many roles in the films of the townspeople and the outlaws and, and such. But it is, we kind of have an all-star band if we wanted to. And, and <laughs> even in the small parts, your casting is just phenomenal. Uh, Brandon Fraser and John Lithgow in this small, smallest part, how did you get those two powerhouses to almost cameos? Martin Scorsese. I mean, it's not, you know, you get that call, it's just like, who would like to do this? Well, everyone. Um, and it, that was shooting, those roles were shooting towards the very end of the film. And we had had a couple of people in mind who weren't available and we were just so blessed that these two amazing actors, Brendan Fraser, the whale had not, I didn't know anything about the whale when we cast him. So, you know, his looks had changed from the time of the mummy and, uh, and John Lithgow was just so excited to be there and, um, you know, it's, just, it, it, it's always incredibly exciting and inspiring to cast for Marty. He's so open to ideas, and so I have a lot of freedom to open my own imagination and then narrow that down and bring him some, some choices. But amazing that John Lithgow, and I, I've also heard that for production, as it had been a very difficult, long production, I think it was exciting for everyone, from what I heard, to have John and Brendan show up. It was a nice little boost of energy at the, at, at the end of a long shoot. And last but not least, Renee Haynes, Indigenous Casting Director. Um, tell us about Lily Gladstone and and finding her for the, this role. She's amazing in it. Yes, she is, isn't she? Um, I had, uh, my specialty is in um, indigenous casting, it has been my entire career. And several years ago, I was doing an open call and um, for another film, and uh, Lily knew the director, and she had been his student before, and she was our reader. And as we saw all these people, she was reading all the roles opposite them, and I was like so taken. I was sitting there trying to look at the actors, and I kept looking at Lily. And the next day I said to the director, I said, why are we seeing all these people? You should be hiring her. And they were like, we thought so too, but we wanted you to say that. Uh -huh. um, and you know, that was her first film. And um, when Ellen so generously called me and said, hey, I wanna, I'd love you to join me on this, um, I read the script. I, had, I was familiar with the book and with a few other books about this episode in the Osage history. And um, what struck me by, of Molly in the script was the moments that she was silent. She doesn't say a lot if you think about it. She, she has great power in her silences. And anytime I'm reading a script, somebody eventually walks through my head and um, I start hearing and seeing them when I'm reading. And Lily would not be denied. She just was there. And it was about those silences because she's so amazing at that. Yeah. Speaking of amazing, uh, tell, tell me about Tantu Cardinal, who plays Molly's mother. Um, Tantu is, um, I mean, I'm sure you've all seen Tantu in many, many projects. Um, I've known Tantu since Dances with Wolves. That was the first time I met her. Um, uh, she is the grand dame of all indigenous actors. She is she is the epitome, and Ellen can tell you, Marty was already familiar with right. her. Right, yes. I mean, he had seen Tantu in... The um, black, black Robe. Right, Black Robe. Mm -hmm. And so we were just, you know, for all of these roles, we saw, I mean, and for Molly, we saw wonderful actresses. Yes. So I just, you know, and, and Lily is not a discovery. Lily is a very accomplished, amazing Absolutely. actress. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, as Renee is saying, Tantu is 
the Grand Dame, mm -hmm. you know. So, and Marty was very hopeful that that she would want to do this part. Um, on the page, it's not a huge role, but thankfully, she did want to be involved in the film, and obviously adds as the matriarch of this amazing family and sad family of women, she just adds such a gravitas mm -hmm. yeah. um, to, to the family. So we were very lucky that she wanted to be a part of the film. Well, I wish I had all night to talk to all of you because it's just fascinating to hear all of you talk. And what a remarkable achievement all of you have have done. We're so honored to have you here tonight. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.